Repeat the sound in joy. Repeat the sound in joy. Repeat, repeat the sound in joy. No more sins. Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to day 14 of our Advent devotionals. Repeat the sounding joy. Today our reading is Luke 2, verses 1 to 7, and our reader is David Lipp. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place, while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Well, Dave read for us there a really famous line, one of the most famous lines in the whole Christmas story. And Mary gave birth to a son and he was laid in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Now that has been a line that has spawned countless uh, wonderful performances in school nativity plays around the country. Maybe you've performed that role yourself, maybe as parents or grandparents, brothers and sisters, you've watched uh, family members um, take part in these nativities and maybe that for you thus far and I stress thus far that's been the pinnacle so far of your acting career to be able to appear and to say those immortal words sorry we've got no room well, I hate to be a party pooper today I really do but actually when Luke says there that there was no room for them in the inn the word that's been translated in is probably actually best translated as guest room remember uh, being a wee bit mischievous with one of our local schools last year and we did a Christmas quiz and I asked the question, what was the name of the innkeeper? Cue much scratching of heads, cue some wonderful, um, wonderfully inventive answers. But notice that what's not in the story, so many of the things we take for granted in the Christmas story, they're not there. Luke doesn't mention an innkeeper. Potentially there's not even an inn. There's no mention of a stable. There's no mention of the cute, cuddly animals surrounding the newborn baby as we see on countless Christmas cards. Luke simply says, he was laid in a manger because there was no room, whether it be in the inn or the guest room. Luke actually records the, the birth of Jesus with remarkable brevity. She, time came, she gave birth, he was laid in a manger. And there's some... Good discussion to be had, perhaps, as to why there was no room for them in the inn. You think for a, a young, obviously heavily pregnant woman arriving in town that, you know, that they would uh, bend over backwards to find accommodation to make her as comfortable as possible. We really just don't know why. Was Bethlehem a particularly heartless, self-centered kind of place? Well, probably not. Joseph would have had family there. That's why he was going after all. His family roots were in that town. Um, had rumours reached Bethlehem about suspicions about Mary? You know, who after all is going to believe this story about an angel appearing to her, her having God's son and she being a virgin and yet pregnant? I mean, Joseph, her own fiancé, hadn't believed her. So what chance would others? Small towns are the same the world over. But a scandal and juicy gossip like that would have had people talking and we all know the kinds of people that pop up who love to think the worst, who love to share scandal. There's suggestions in the Gospels that rumours about, uh, about Mary, about Jesus' birth had continued. There's a moment in John chapter 8 verse 41 where the crowd say to Jesus, we are not illegitimate children. Now, there's different ways, admittedly, you can read that line, but a lot of commentators, a lot of writers think that that's an insinuation about the circumstance of Jesus' birth, that these suggestions of Mary somehow being unfaithful um, had continued on. They were saying, we are not illegitimate children. But, you know, we don't know. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is what Luke does record for us. As I said, he's recorded this birth with remarkable brevity. Time came. She gave birth, 
but he records this detail. He was laid in a manger, for there was no room for them in the guest room. So why does he record that and what significance does that have? Well, it's got a lot of significance and it's worth us pausing to meditate on. It tells us from the very beginning, from almost his very first breath in the world, the Son of God knew what it was to be poor. The Son of God had nowhere to lay his head. Well, technically he did have somewhere to lay his head, but it's an animal's feeding dish. No comfortable bed, no nice soft down memory foam pillow. From the very outset of his life, Jesus was born not into a palace, but born into these conditions of poverty and humility. Jesus, in his life, the Bible says, knew what it was to be poor, to be isolated, to be excluded, to be marginalized. The Apostle Paul says that though he was rich, yet he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Though he was rich, he was, he is God. He made himself poor coming into this world. And why does he do that? So we, through his poverty, might be made rich. He stoops down to lift us up. He comes down to make us uh, spiritually rich. The Son of God has come to seek and to save those who are lost. And in doing so, he's willing to experience poverty and hardships. Think of even the early years of Jesus. He's born his, his first moments in this world in an animal's food dish. And by the time he's two, he's a refugee and an asylum seeker. King Herod is trying to take his life. Joseph has warned that it's going to happen to, to, to flee. So Joseph, Mary and Jesus have to, to grab their stuff and leave and run to Egypt and become asylum seekers until it's safe for them to return to their homeland. And we've seen in our own news footage over the last few years just the, the hardships that refugees endure, the horrors they flee and the hardships they're willing to endure as they seek um, safety. Jesus experienced all these things himself. And that's by the time he's two. Jesus knows what it is to be poor. He would say himself, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, and that's his way of talking about himself, but the Son of Man, but he has nowhere to lay his head. Isn't that amazing? Jesus created the whole world. He made it all. In many ways you could say it was all his because he's its creator. And yet, when he's living in this world, he has nowhere to lay his head. Even the foxes, even the birds have more than he does. Jesus is king. And yet he makes himself poor that we might have the hope of eternal life. So if you're not a Christian today, there's a wonderful invitation for you today to think about who God really is. That God was willing to make himself poor so that if we put our trust in him, if our sins are forgiven in him, through his poverty we might be the spiritually rich. It's not necessarily talking about, about earthly riches. But, the, but if we have our trust in Jesus, if we have a relationship with him, we have eternal life, we have forgiveness of sins, and we are the richest people there are. But if we have everything else in the world, but we don't have Jesus, the Bible says we have nothing. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but to lose his soul? But even if we have nothing and we have Jesus, we have everything. And you're invited to him today. You're invited to trust him. You're invited to come to him. So think today on the fact that how low he was willing to go how much he was willing to give up in order to bring us to be with him in heaven forever. And if we are a follower of Jesus, there's an implication for us to think on as well. He's, he commands us to take up our crosses every day and to follow him. To run the risk of facing the same marginalization, the same isolation, exclusion as he does. You know, isn't one of the reasons we're so often scared to share our faith, to invite people to church, to invite people to our services is because we're scared of how they might react. We're scared that they might somehow stop talking to us or mock us or get angry with us or sever relationships with us. Now, most of the time, of course, people respond in ways that are far more positive than we can ever imagine. We always think worst case scenario. But even if they were to react in that way, in that moment, we share the marginalization of Jesus himself. Are we willing 
to follow his command, to pick up our cross and to take steps, to take risks that may lead to these same things for us. And if they do, we can take heart because we know that Christ understands that that was his experience too. One last thing I want to add before we um, close for today. As we're thinking about the poverty of Jesus, that he made himself poor, there's a line in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul is almost starting out in his missionary uh, endeavours and he's told, remember the poor. And he says, I was glad about that because that's the one thing I wanted to do anyway. Remember the poor. There's a million and one ways we can do that this Christmas. Coronavirus has hit a lot of people, a lot of businesses, a lot of families, and I'm aware of that. And some wonderful local charities, a lot of wonderful, great work going on, and I know that's going on here in Allness and in Bergordon, some wonderful charitable work um, supported by our wonderful local councillors. Um, there's many ways we can support, but as a church, one of the things we're supporting this year is Mission International's The Big Meal. For three pounds, we can provide a Christmas meal for someone enduring extreme poverty um, across 16 countries. Mission International working with people who've not eaten a meal in weeks, who've endured real hardships, who've experienced not just coronavirus, but things like floods, locusts, uh, famines, who've endured real hardships. Um, so we're supporting that as a congregation, and I know there's a lot of demands upon your time, upon your heart, and upon your resources. But if you are willing and feel led to support that, there is information in the, in the links underneath these videos and you'll be able to um, go to the Mission International website, you'll be able to read about the big meal, and if you wish to make a donation, there's an, a link there to give you the opportunity to do so. But let's pray together. Lord Jesus, how amazing it is to think that though you were rich, yet you made yourself poor, that we through your poverty might be made rich. That you would be willing to endure the hardships and the sufferings of living in this world when you were so comfortable and well off in heaven lacking nothing perfect love perfect joy perfect everything and yet you were willing to suffer that we might have life how hard the times lord we find it to to put the needs of others ahead of ourselves but we thank you that we have a god who does just that a god who is willing to serve a God who is humble, a God who is willing to suffer in order to save. So bless our thoughts today. Bless all who listen to these videos. And we ask all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, God bless you all.